about heritage policy in relation to climate change, um, looking specifically at the experience from the Republic of Ireland. Um, I finished my PhD last year at the Dublin Institute of Technology, where I was looking at the potential impacts of climate change on archaeological sites. So some of the data I'm showing you today is from that research. Sorry. Okay, so in the presentation I'm just going to talk about, firstly about the issues with engaging with climate change and how that can be sometimes problematic, and uh, present some of the case studies which I undertook for my PhD, then talk about current Irish policy in this area, and a brief conclusion. So firstly, as Neil has already said, um, the, I, the climate change stated by the IPCC in their last report um, you know, climate change is unequivocally here, and human-induced climate change is beyond reasonable doubt. Um, by climate change, they mean um, a change in the average climate, which is measured over a 30-year period. And uh, despite that, engagement with the issue of climate change is still sort of seen as a bit of a minority issue in society. And I would say one of the reasons for that is that it's impossible to point to a single events such as Cyclone Pam and to state categorically, well, that's due to climate change as opposed to uh, climate variability. Uh, what we can say for the UK and for Ireland as well is that we're going to experience um, hotter, drier summers, warmer, wetter winters, rising sea levels, and an increase in the severity and frequency of extreme weather events. And some of these patterns are already emerging in the, in the recorded data. Another issue that we have to deal with is the uncertainty in terms of how the future climate is going to look. And one of the reasons for the uncertainty is that it really depends on how society responds. So are our climate, uh, are our um, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions going to stabilize or are they going to continue to increase, um, therefore making climate change more severe? So this slide really um, illustrates that quite well. It shows it, the black line. The black line there is the actual recorded temperature for northern Sweden for a period between 1960 and 1990. And all the colored lines are the efforts of different climate models to simulate the temperature for that period. So you can see there's a huge degree of difference between the different models. And although many of them um, simulate the general trend, they're nearly all out by some degree or another. So you have to bear this in mind when we're thinking about what the future is going to be like. Of course, then when it comes to understanding how this climate change is going to affect cultural heritage, it's a very complex um, issue. And as Neil was explaining, there's a lot of different um, factors which act together in combination with other existing um, environmental and human factors to produce different effects. And this slide just shows a few of the potential issues which you might have to consider when you're thinking about climate change impacts. So um, in my thesis then, I, I interviewed 30 professionals working in the field of heritage and climate change from 15 different countries. And they identified some issues which they had encountered in their work. The first one was what I've already discussed, this idea of the uncertainty and complexity of the issue. And the difficulty they had in determining whether impacts they were seeing were really due to climate change or merely climate variability or some other environmental factor. And also the difficulty in knowing what to monitor and how to monitor in terms of climate change. And one of the reasons for this is the long-term issue in that you need to be um, gathering data for 30 30-year period, so it has to be sustainable over that time frame. Um, the researchers particularly flagged a difficulty that they had encountered in short-term thinking, which is tends to be um, in policy and funding decisions, which tend to be over three to five-year periods. So again, it was hard for them to engage with the long-term issues. And finally, several respondents also said there's a degree of denial and possibly even fear out there as to what climate change um, 
what climate change really means, and that leads to a certain amount of future discounting where it's seen as a risk in the far future and we'll just deal with what's here right now and not think about it too much. Of course, um, nothing operates in a vacuum, so um, this policy is also influenced by what's happening in current affairs. And if we go back to the Irish situation, um, in 2009 we had a, a Green Party Minister for the Environment and Heritage, and he commissioned a report from Icomus Ireland on potential impacts of climate change on the built heritage and how we might monitor that. Um, unfortunately, by the time the report was published in early 2010, there'd been a change of government. <coughs> Green Party was out and the report was not really that interesting anymore. Um, the same period we had a financial crisis in Ireland, which I'm sure you're all aware of, and that basically um, sort of crippled the heritage sector. We, we suffered um, from severe cuts. If you look at the figure there, the, the government's heritage unit over the period from 2008 to now has suffered a 77% <coughs> cut in its budget. So with those kinds of cuts, Nothing really major has been done in terms of developing policy and moving the issue forward. So for my own research then, I conducted vulnerability assessments of Ireland's two World Heritage Sites to the potential impacts of projected climate change. So the two World Heritage Sites in the Republic of Ireland are Bruna Boigne, which is a megalithic passage grave assemblage in County Meath, and Skelly Michael, which is an early Christian monastic site off the coast of Kerry. So just some pictures to set the scene. This is a view of the cultural landscape in Bruna Boy, looking from the Tumulus down across to Newgrange, which you can just see there. This is the entrance to Newgrange. With the, the entrance stone has this famous <laughs> treble spiral carving. And in addition to the, the different, um, the megalithic passage graves there, of which there are over 30, there's also uh, an amazing collection of rock art, both on the stones, both outside and inside the tombs. This then is a view from Skelly Michael across to the mainland, and you can see the um, very steep topography of Skelly. And this is a view of the central monastic enclosure with the characteristic dry stone beehive huts. So this slide then just shows um, a sample of the vulnerability assessment results, which um, I did for the, the two sites. I've just given you the top line here. So these are the impacts which vulnerability would seem to be highest. So if we look at um, Bruna Boyne then, for, I looked at four heritage values there. So for the rock art, the, the impact which came out as most concerning was changes in biodeterioration. So this is the kind of cumulative long-term effect of climate change in altering uh, the nature and scale of uh, surface biodeterioration of stones. For the buried deposits, it was changes in land use, so that's an indirect effect of climate change, the predicted shift from pastoral to arable farming and the knock-on in terms of ploughing and roof damage. For structures and monuments, it was more catastrophic effects of climate change related to flooding, structural collapse, things like Neil touched on. And then for cultural landscape, again, flooding and changes in land use. So there's an overlap between the different um, heritage values within the, uh, and, and impacts. For Skelly Michael then, for the buried deposits, it didn't actually come up with um, an impact of high vulnerability. And this is because the, this very shallow soil cover there and the, the deposits are mostly in sheltered areas in, within the monastery. Um, for structures and features, uh, the impacts were related to severe weather and collapse, erosion, structural damage, but also in terms of access to the island and that potentially in the future the ability of the Office of Public Works to conduct maintenance and conservation of the site could be hampered by the severe weather. And for the cultural landscape, soil erosion, loss of vegetation and so on, but also potentially change in the avian species, which is a very important natural um, value of the site. So, again, the assessment highlighted many areas which are already of concern and where climate change may just act as an added stressor, pushing uh, the system to tipping point, as well as some potentially new impacts. Um, basically, it was intended to aid policymakers in coming up with conservation and management plans which take account of the 
potential changing um, environment in the future. Um, of course, you have to bear in mind, as we already said, the based on climate models, which are inherently uncertain, and which have a coarse resolution. So they don't, uh, the models I was taking, they give you a 10 kilometer grid square. And so they don't take into account any local microclimates. And we're looking at long-term effects of many interacting variables. So basically any policy which is based on these kinds of assessments needs to, needs to be supported by monitoring and needs to be kept under review. So if we go back to um, national policy then, I suppose um, I would describe it really to date as um, being reactive. So if I give you two examples, um, oops, sorry. The first one is the ruin stop. This, these are guidelines which were issued by the department for owners of um, unoccupied historic structures. Uh, so in terms of maintenance and um, you know, preventing damage from severe weather. And it was really issued in response to high profile collapse of a Norman tower house and a lot of criticism which came, came after that. Whether that's climate change again, we could argue it was really down to poor maintenance. But um, of course, with the projections for more severe weather, we're likely to see more of these kinds of issues arising. Um, similarly, they're currently working on a strategy for um, coastal erosion and how to deal with um, human remains that, that may be exposed. And this came about because of the large amount of coastal erosion, I think you had the same in Britain, from storms of 2013 to 2014. Prior to that, the department would have had a handful of reports of human remains being exposed. They would have sent someone down in response to each one. But in that winter, they got 30 reports in one month, and they simply couldn't cope with it. And so as a result, they're now developing a strategy for the National Museum as to how they will handle this going forward. So basically, you know, policy developed in response to an event. Having said that, however, um, Ireland does have a national climate change adaptation framework, and that requires uh, sectoral uh, plans. And one of the sectors which has to give its plan uh, this year is built and natural heritage. So at the moment, um, it's going to stakeholder review, I think, next week, and they're hoping to have their national adaptation plan for built and natural heritage by the end of the year. <coughs> so knowing I was coming here, I uh, rang the officials in the department and asked them what they were thinking about. And um, they didn't want to give me too much information on the big civil servants, but <laughs> they, uh, they did mention some of the key issues which they're thinking about. So the first one is managing expectations, because although they're drawing up this lovely new adaptation plan, they don't actually have any increased resources to undertake any projects. Um, another one, which I think another speaker will talk about, is this idea of maladaptation. So, um, you know, retrofitting buildings and, and doing it properly. Um, they're very keen to develop long-term policies and plans so that they are not involved in this sort of reactive policy making, which they have been up until now. And they want to put the emphasis on monitoring and recording rather than on taking heroic measures. Um, and this probably links back somewhat to the fact that they don't have the money for any heroic measures in any case. Uh, of course, when it comes to drawing up policy, Ireland tends to look to the UK and to Europe for best practice. We do have a couple of documents which um, are homegrown. So the first of those was a 2009 report by the Heritage Council, which they did in conjunction with Fulcher Ireland, which is the Irish Tourist Board. So they were looking at the implications of climate change for coasts and waterways for both natural and cultural heritage. Um, it's a depth-based study, but it's quite a good reference document still. In 2010, then, that ICMOS report, which I mentioned earlier, was published. That was looking at how um, climate change impacts could be monitored um, on um, heritage sites. So ICMOS Ireland um, just recommended two sets of monitors. First, climate monitors to monitor the climate on the site itself. And then impact monitors. And those would be site-specific, depending on what impacts you are concerned about, depending again on your heritage values. And then, obviously, the data should be collected over the long term, and then um, comparing the two sets of data 
could clarify any issues that you might be having. Um, one practical um, outcome of the report was that a weather station was established on Clomac Noise, which is a very important uh, monastic site in the Midlands of Ireland, and that is linked up to Met Air, which would be the Irish Meteorological Service, so they collect the data from that. So going forward, hopefully you might get some more of these established. Um, in my own research, I um, designed and piloted this little tool. I called it the Legit. And it's designed to look at surface weathering of stone and related materials. So the cubes are measured and then exposed on different sites. There are five sites around Ireland at the moment. And the idea is to measure them periodically and then to see if we're seeing any um, trends in terms of the types of weathering or the rates of weathering that are occurring. So that pilot is ongoing. So um, I don't want to be too negative, but <laughs> uh, well, climate change is here and it's probably just going to get worse. So uh, how are we going to deal with it? I don't know. In Ireland, we still sort of have an uphill battle ahead of us because I feel like we're, we're behind now, particularly with the, the whole financial mess we've been in. So, but we are, there is movement happening, so hopefully we'll, you know, we'll progress quickly. Um, just in general, I think, you know, we can't afford as a profession and as a society, we can't really afford to, to wait for certainty, uh, to doubt that climate change is happening and that it's going to affect us, or to resist change. And this is what Neil was saying. You know, adaptation is not resistance, it's adaptation. So we need to adapt, we need to mitigate. And my final picture is we're always stop doing this. <laughs> um, obviously that's in Australia, not Ireland. <laughs> probably wearing more clothes. Um, so yeah, so just I uh, just wanted to thank all the people who found me and um, and thank you for listening and please contact me if you have any questions.